Good evening and welcome to the regular board meeting for the Akron Public Schools Board of Education for Monday, September 28th, 2020. Roll call, please. Dr. Akbar. Here. Mr. Alexander. Present. Ms. Dockery. Here. Mr. Bravo. Present. Dr. Hall. Aye. Mrs. Mansfield. Here. Mrs. McKittrick. Here. Thank you. Thank you. And if we could all mute and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, at this time, we'll open it up for community and school reflections. If anyone would like to start, I think I can see most everyone. So give me a high sign. Ms. McKittrick, you can start. And then whoever else, if you could line up in the queue, please. Thank you, President Bravo. Good evening, everyone. Last week, I attended the Council of Urban Boards of Education, or CUBE, three-day national conference. And I would like to give a shout out to Aaron Markovic for his presentation on the national stage all his work and for shining a spotlight on APS. So congratulations and thanks for everything you do, Mr. Markovic. Thank you. Thank you, anyone else? All right, hearing none. Uh, we have no request to address the board this evening, so we will move right into approval of the meeting minutes for Monday, September 14th, 2020. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Thank you. We have a motion from Ms. McKittrick, a second from Ms. Autry. Any comments, questions, or discussion on the meeting minutes? Hearing none, roll call, please. Dr. Hall. Dr. Hall. Sorry, Ryan, my internet cut out. Can you uh, repeat the last part? So there's a motion by Ms. McKittrick and a second by Ms. Autry for the approval of the meeting minutes. Aye. Thank you. Mrs. Mansfield? Yes. Mrs. McKittrick? Yes. Dr. Akbar? Yes. Mr. Alexander? Yes. Ms. Autry? Yes. Mr. Bravo? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Superintendent's recommendations, personnel? Uh, Mr. President, I wish to recommend approval of the personnel recommendations presented in categories 5 through 16. I would also like to highlight in uh, Category 16, uh, regretting to report the death of uh, Mrs. Betty Moore, uh, who passed away on Friday, September 18th. She was a member of our child nutrition staff at Higher CLC, and she had been an employee of Akron Public Schools for 27 years. Thank you so much. Certainly our condolences to her family. Uh, do we have a motion on the personnel recommendations? So moved. Second. Thank you. We have a motion from Dr. Akbar, a second by Ms. Mansfield. Any comments, questions, or discussion on personnel? All right, hearing and seeing none, uh, roll call, please. Mrs. Mansfield? Yes. Mrs. McKittrick? Yes. Dr. Akbar? Yes. Mr. Alexander? Yes. Ms. Autry? Yes. Mr. Bravo? Yes. Dr. Hall? Aye. Thank you. Next, Mr. President, I wish to recommend approval of the resolutions and motions presented in category 21. Thank you. Do we have a motion on the consent agenda items? So moved. Second. Second. Sorry. Thank you, a motion for Ms. McKittrick, a second for Mr. Alexander. And before we open it up for comments, questions, or discussion, I did want to turn it over to Mr. Pendleton. 
Thank you. I wanted to make note of a couple items here. I'm going to present my screen just for Does everybody see the general timeline highlighted there? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Just to put into perspective the annual appropriations measure, um, on or before June 30th, the board is required to pass a permanent, uh, finish the permanent appropriations for the prior year and pass a temporary resolution for the next fiscal year. On your screen here is an outline of all that's related from tax budget to amounts and rates, temporary budget on the right hand side of that screen as you look at it. And then on or before September 30th, the board's required to pass their permanent appropriations resolution. Just wanted to show you the depth of the budget process uh, in a timeline that uh, I think this makes a little bit more sense to me in looking at it this way. The general fund appropriations measure is just under $350 million, $347 million uh, this year. It is broken out by object so that the board is appropriating at a higher level than what is required. And I commend the board on this level of reporting. So we report on salaries, fringe benefits, purchase services, supplies, and materials, capital, others, and any transfers in and out. Uh, on the rest of the year. Then all other funds, as you see in your resolutions from special revenue to debt service, capital projects, all funds told, including facility commissions, capital, <coughs> special enterprise funds, we're looking at a total appropriations resolution of about 565 million. And again, I just wanted to show, okay back here okay does everybody see the screen the uh, schedule went away yeah, okay, great. <clears throat> also of note in tonight's consent come part of this is the summit county COVID-19 public school reopening grant and as was reported in finance committee and we'll detail that between uh, Ms. Autry, Dr. Hall, and I, a little bit later, uh, there is a resolution included on the consent to accept the funding in the amount of $2.6 million to a specially identifiable fund. We were not counting on these funds, and um, extra thanks to Summit County for allocating $100 per student from their CARES Act uh, Coronavirus Relief Fund allocation. So again, this is an acceptance of an additional $2.6 million that we're in the process now of recoding so that uh, we use those funds for the required purposes before the end of December this year and that we get to stretch our other CARES Act ESSER funds longer into the school year. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Dr. Akbar. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, Mr. Pendleton mentioned one, um, which is the CARES Act grant in excess of 2.6 million, which I wanted to highlight. But I also wanted to make note of two other things. One, as we talked about uh, equity and we talk about, I'm um, trying to, to close any of those equity gaps that we know exist. Um, we did also receive $151,000 grant uh, for broadband connectivity. Uh, which will support our students as well. Um, and then I also want to make note, uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more in the uh, Legal Contracts and Board Policy Committee report. Um, but there was also a $5,000 grant from Acre Community Foundation, which I want to thank them publicly for supporting the, the establishment of our um, employee resource groups. Thank you, Dr. Akbar. Any other comments, questions, or discussion on consent agenda items, Mr. Alexander? Yes, I just want to, uh, when we talk about those COVID funds, thank you to County Executive Irene Shapiro because uh, they they also gave us the money. If it wasn't for them, that we wouldn't probably have gotten. So thanks to her for and her team for allowing uh, to think about Akron Public Schools so we can uh, have the funds to move forward on some projects that we need for our students. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? 
Okay. Just also want to echo thank you uh, to County Executive Eileen Shapiro and her staff for uh, their work in supporting school districts across the county. Much appreciated. Mr. Hamilton, roll call, please. Mrs. McKittrick? Yes. Dr. Akbar? Yes. Mr. Alexander? Yes. Ms. Autry? Yes. Mr. Bravo? Yes. Dr. Hall? Aye. Mrs. Mansfield? Yes. Thank you. And finally, Mr. President, I wish to recommend approval of the business affairs recommendations presented in category 23. Thank you. Do we have a motion on the business affairs items? So moved. So moved. Second. Thank you. A motion by Ms. McKittrick, a second from Mr. Alexander. Any comments, questions, or discussion on business affairs? Hearing and seeing none, roll call, please. Dr. Akbar? Yes. Mr. Alexander? Yes. Ms. Autry? Yes. Mr. Bravo? Yes. Dr. Hall? Aye. Mrs. Mansfield? Yes. Mrs. McKittrick? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Superintendent's report? Yeah, um, <clears throat> several items. Um, the first one, uh, this morning I sent you all an updated copy of a draft um, in terms of some uh, ideas we have on servicing students with um, uh, uh, IEPs uh, based on the conversation from the last board meeting. And um, I have uh, Tammy Brady who can answer any questions or just run through that um, document with some of the options uh, that the team has put together and are looking at. It's still a draft document. There's a few more things that we need to do, but um, I can have Tammy Brady address any issues or questions you might have. Uh, thank you, Dr. James. I am presenting for you now um, a summary of what you saw earlier just to give um, a quick overall, these are some of the factors to take into consideration when we do look at each, each option. So these are options for site-based services for students with the most significant disabilities on site while we're doing remote learning. Just to summarize the data, there are 3,900, oops, Sorry, I don't know what I just did. 3,903 students with the most severe disabilities at, or with disabilities in Akron Public Schools. Of those, we have 448 low incidence students and those are the students with the most severe disabilities. So these are students that might be served in, but not exclusively, but might be served in a self-contained classroom such as a multiple disability classroom, a classroom for students with autism, and that would be predominantly the students we would be looking at. <clears throat> so when we look at the options, just to summarize very briefly, option A is the remote academics and on-site related services. So just as we are doing now, all students with disabilities will participate in remote learning for their academics during the course of the school day. But then we would be offering related services at an APS school building during the course of the school day at specifically scheduled times and dates. So students who needed speech, OT, PT, we would schedule those in at a, at a building site so that they could receive those services in person. Option B would be a blended learning and that would be possibly three days on site and two days remote. So these students who opted to come on site would come on site to an APS building three days a week, perhaps with a shortened instructional day to receive their specially designed instruction and also any related services. The other two days, the students would remain remote and would also do be provided with supplemental, perhaps paper pencil pat learning packets that reinforce and support the on-site instruction. And then finally, option C 
would also be the remote academics and on-site after school services to support IEP goals. So all of the students, just as we are now, would participate in remote learning for academics during the day. However, on an individualized basis, we would have some students may come on site after school hours for an identified number of hours per week, for, for example, perhaps two hours for specific interventions and support that are related to their IEP goals. Related service providers, so we would include speech, OT, and PT in this, would apply to teach after school. They would be paid extended time for planning and instruction to provide those supports to our students. Um, so basically option A and option C, what they have in common is that they both continue with the remote learning, but both do provide opportunity for on-site learning. Option A being on-site with related services only during the course of the school day. And then option C being on-site after school, so three o'clock or after. And that would include on-site in-person learning for, but from both the intervention specialists for specific IEP goals and intervention, and then potentially also for related service providers, OT, PT, and speech. They are, we had a shared um, team with a MD team, a shared leadership team. We did meet to discuss all of the options and brainstorm what would be best for our students because we know that we are anxious to have our students back in school and that they are in need of their services. Our team really is leaning towards option A or option C at this time. So I'm gonna go ahead and take this off the screen right now and um, see if there are any questions I could answer. Great, thank you, Ms. McKittrick. Could you walk us through how you decided that A and C would be the most palatable for you, please? Thank you. Really, um, when we talked through all of the options, option B, obviously, we really like the blended learning option and we feel that that would be beneficial to our students. However, when we're looking at how we might be staffing that, so if all staff returned to be able to be in their classrooms and support the learning of their students, we could see that working very well. But if all staff were not required to return, we could see some difficulties for the students with transitioning. So we're talking about a population of students who do not transition very well. So if they did not, were unable to go to their regular building, which they are familiar with, or, or receive services from their regular teacher, who has been spending the last two and a half weeks re establishing relationships with the students, the transition time for our students with the most significant disabilities is great. And so we felt that that might almost be more harmful to the students than good to put them through multiple transitions in a very short period of time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mansfield. Sorry, I, sorry, I thought Bruce was next, so I wasn't ready. Um, Thank you for that question, Mrs. McKetrick. That was one of mine. Um, I have three. I'm just going to throw them all at you at once, Tammy. You ready? So um, have we looked at already surveying staff and parents to see where we are on that um, as far as who wants to come back, who's ready to come back, who is an absolute no? That's question one. Are we proposing this, Mr. James, for the or at the nine, after the nine week mark, or is this being proposed as prior to that? And then how can we best help these families? Because what I'm seeing as far as going through the rest of this pandemic, we're probably gonna have some difficult transitions. This, is, this may be a back and forth as we go, even if we come back, if we came back, um, you know, partially there's going to be occasional shutdowns here and there. Are there ways that we as a board can help support you to 
to help with those those difficult transitions. So those are my my three. So a survey is our next steps. We we plan to survey both the families as well as um, obviously the staff. And so that was our next steps. We wanted to be able to get the options to the school board first and receive feedback on that. But um, our team is planning to meet again this week and we know that we want to move rather quickly. So that survey we would hope would happen this week. Um, we certainly were looking at as far as when to make this happen. It certainly could be at the conclusion, you know, as we move into the next nine weeks, but we know that we still have about four weeks and we feel um, we can make it, it, it will take us at least four weeks. There are multiple things involved. So we have to um, find out how many students are coming. We have to look at what our staffing is and where what locations we'll be able to use, as well as um, child nutrition has to be able to set up how they're gonna do the meals. And then transportation is also an additional factor. So there are many factors. So it's it's not, it's, it's kind of a heavy lift to make happen very quickly. We would need several weeks, which may put us almost at the nine week mark we might be able to make it happen a couple of weeks ahead of time. Then the last thing was those transitions because what I'm seeing um, as I sit in my house and, and listen to what's coming out of some of the other locations around us, um, I'm, I'm listening to things quarantine and unquarantine and start up and start and, and shut down. And we know that's what we're gonna face how are how can we best support you and our families as as we get into situations where that's probably going to happen well we do know that there's going to be transitions no matter what we decide but that's kind of where the struggle was with option b if the students could not report with their teacher of record so for example they're in remote learning now and um, we're pretty pleased with the percentage. Most of our students, even those with significant disabilities, truly are connecting online. And our teachers are having successes, although we know these are the students who struggle the most and who need some in-person learning. They've established those relationships. So if I came back on site two days, three days a week with that teacher who's established that relationship, that's, you know, coming on site may be a small transition, but I know that teacher. If I had to go back remote and I still have that teacher, okay, I've done this already, but it's still my teacher. So I think that those are, you know, where our biggest concern comes in for transition is bopping the students in and out of different buildings perhaps or with different staff members. So that's our concern. So our goal would be really if we could have our staff um, of record working with our students. Thanks, that makes so much sense. We wanna be able, be able to support you in that and also those families, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Mansfield. We have Mr. Alexander, then Dr. Hall, and then Dr. Akbar. Ms. Brady, I have a question because you it made me think about it when we start talking about the teachers. With the staff, if we, if we were doing blended learning, would the staff be required to come in or is that optional? For them to come in uh, due to this COVID situation uh, to the buildings, and uh, how would that if they if it was optional and teachers opted out not to come back into the classroom, how would that affect the operations and what would we do to address the situation at that point in time? Thank you. So those are our concerns at this point. Our staff are all operating under the factor that it is optional for them. They can teach from um, remotely from home or they can come into school. So we're working under the assumption, um, unless the board decided to make a decision otherwise, that they would continue to have that option. As far as staffing goes, as you brought up as your second question, that's our greatest concern. It would be perhaps more difficult to be able to ensure that um, we could staff all of those classrooms, but we know that we have a large number of staff who are ready to return to work. So we feel pretty confident that we could work around it. That's where the transition then becomes the bigger problem. 
Okay, yeah, because that was my concern. If one of those the teachers were not, uh, uh, they're not, they were not ready to come back, or felt that the, they should just stay at home versus coming in due to the pandemic. So I, I wanted to make sure that they would be okay, and that we'd have enough staff that would be able to provide the service and and, and, and teach uh, our, our students, which would be which is the most important. Right, and at thing. this option, at this point, I think it would still be considered an option to work from home. Like I said, a large number of staff indicated, but until we do that survey, I can't really even guess how many would feel uncomfortable returning to work. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hall and then Dr. Hapner. Yeah, thanks. Uh, first, Ms. Brady, thank you for doing this. I mean, I know that, that we were really keen to kind of get some options on the table. And so, um, first, I just want to say thank you um, for all the hard work that, that, that you and your team have done around this. Um, so I, I guess, so I had a couple comments slash questions and I was kind of, I'll kind of mix them, um, as I sort of move through my, my soliloquy, if you will. Um, but, uh, so first off, um, you know, I know that we're, that we're always trying to balance sort of student safety, you know, versus their educational needs. And so I know that, you know, as we stand on the precipice of, of, of going into cold and flu season, kind of echoing Ms. Mansfield's comments, you know, um, you know, option B. And a, a, a challenge is around potentially having to pull kids right back out of school and how and how to sort of is that is that going to be as well um you know and then uh, so that's sort of a comment around that and then um you meant so but 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 as it relates to option b it sounded like um what you were saying is that option b was preferred option was it solely because of staffing concerns or or were there other reasons why uh option b was not the preferred option I don't believe it was solely because of staffing as um, the transition piece was huge, not knowing how long that would be for. Now, should we decide that, you know, for example, should it be decided that the district would remain remote for a longer period of time? Um, could that be considered as a, a better option, knowing that the students would be in a blended learning for a longer period of time and not just be a couple of weeks and flipping out? then I, I think that that could be considered. It certainly is an option that gives students more time face-to-face -face with a teacher. Roger that, okay. Uh, and then my other question, you know, and again, you know, a lot of the questions that, that, I, that you all hear, hear me ask on a regular basis, I, I talk a lot about sort of collaboration, collegiality and transparency. And, um, and so I wanted to ask, so, you know, so have we been able to engage um, our partners over at AEA in, in these conversations? And, and what is your, and if so, what, what is your, uh, what is your take on um, you know, what, what their level of support is uh, for the various options. The team that I mentioned that we had, um, the shared leadership team with MD um, teachers and also related service providers was a collaboration with AEA. So we, um, the team members were um, uh, invited to attend from both the Office of Special Education and also from AEA. So that was a definitely a collaborative effort. Yeah. I did refu review with um, AEA leadership following that meeting, uh, summary of the meeting and what we came up with and what were the preferred models, which was A and C. Okay, Roger that. And then and I, and I think the last question I had for this for the moment um, was uh, between options A and C, um, and, and, and I know I'm putting you on the spot just a bit by asking this question this way, uh, but between A and C, do you do you have a preference between A and C? I like C because um, option A, it's providing the related services on site during the day, but there isn't an option for intervention because our intervention specialist in those classrooms will be providing remote instruction during the day. So with option C, we can hire intervention specialists who can provide some specific intervention related to the student's IEP goals. It would be after, you know, three o'clock or after, but we would be able to look at providing more services to our students so we could provide intervention from the special education teacher, but also potentially speech, OT, and PT. So more opportunities with option C um, for students to have face-to-face -face interaction. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Apgar. 
Yes, so um, I, my, my question is somewhat follow up to uh, Dr. Hall's one. Um, I know he put you on the spot to have you pick which one was your favorite, but to be honest with you, uh, C is my favorite option. Um, and I'm wondering, it sounds just from reading it, again, you know, it's like half a page, so I'm sure there's more to it than what I, I read. But just reading it, it sounds very doable um, and that it could actually be done um, before the four or five weeks from now. So I'm wondering is, uh, how long do you feel like it would take to transition to that process? And when would, or and this might be a question for Dr. James actually, but when are you um, asking us to make a decision related to uh, our students in special education? Well, I'll answer number one. Number two is definitely a question for Dr. James. Um, number one, I mean, we could, if it was decided we were going to go with that, we would do an immediate posting for the teachers. And um, that isn't really a very heavy lift. It would be selecting what sites would we use because obviously in after school environment, we may not use every single building. But those decisions could be made pretty easily once we have hired the staff and um, bring everyone up to speed on all of our expectations for sanitation and PPE and all of that. So I think that could happen quickly uh, once we are able to hire the staff. So um, just to chime in here, um, I think Dr. Hall mentioned that there are a lot of moving parts uh, with this. If we really want to try and provide some of those services, I would be in favor of option C. I would be in favor of getting that done, um, you know, getting that started. But I also want to make you, you know, aware that as we come to the end of our first nine weeks, we're also going to have to figure out how we're going to transition our regular ed students who we've gotten, you know, concerns from parents. I had one parent um, write me an email today, has four kids in our district, two at the secondary level, one at elementary, and has some concerns about, um, you know, his kindergartner and just saying he's on um, with his uh, son one day a week because he had, that's a furlough day for him and says it's really difficult and so we need to also, this will be tied into how we bring the other staff back and students back. So um, I would certainly be in favor of starting with this option C of providing some of that in the afternoon, um, working on that. But then we're going to, you know, we're going to have to also transition um, the rest of the district to probably a more blended model where maybe some of the half of the kids are in two days, the other two days is for the other half, like an A and B group. Um, but that's going to impact the delivery for some of these services because then we'll have to, those kids will have to transition, I think, again into how we're going to, um, you know, deal with that hybrid uh, type model where there's some on site during the day. To teaching for our students and then some remote. So I would certainly like to see us dive into, you know, getting people back as quickly as possible, at least phasing it in. I think if you might have said that earlier, Dr. Akbar, mm -hmm. um, you know, trying to phase it in and it's our, you know, a very delicate population and we probably need to do that first. And so Mrs. Mansfield's uh, question and concern I, I just think we need to be cautious because you're right. We've seen in some of our other districts and schools issues about, you know, returning. So believe me, Deborah Folk is working on some things with one of our buildings. So look at how that's going to be set up, how we're going to track kids and make sure that we know who they're around in terms of assigned seating. So it is a it, 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 it's a heavy lift, but it's not impossible. Right. Sorry for running on. No, no, no. I, I actually appreciated everything that you shared um, because it. I, I don't think it's only for us, but it's for whoever else is listening. Um, you know, these aren't just a turn the switch and then everything goes back to the way we said normal used to be. 
and we have all of these different factors that uh, you know the administration is considering. Um, and I think it's important that we talk through those things. Uh, but the other, the one piece, and this is a minor editorializing and minor question, uh, Miss Brady. But one of the things that I found to be um, most eye-opening, and I know uh, I'm not trying to um, simmer down the entire report to just this one thing, but I did not realize that there was so many preschool students with special um, accommodations. That was eye-opening for me. And I'm wondering, as we consider, you know, one, we don't know when we'll come back. I mean, you know, we're going to consider that in a few weeks and I, I can't even predict how that vote will go. So I don't even want to start to opine on that. But I think that uh, when we think about option C and we think about our preschool students, to me, that's those are two groups and I, and they might be the same group actually. But those, those are just two groups that I feel like we, regardless of what we do uh, in a few weeks, uh, I'm personally in favor of us looking at how do we provide services for them. And I like the, you know, the after school option because it gives those parents and families who want to opt in and say that my child needs these additional services. You can identify what those are. You can go to them and we can do a better job of, you know, providing the physical distance, knowing that these are um, students that need high touch. And that's the other concern that I have. And I think I stated that to uh, Dr. James, probably in a, a meeting we had, um, not a big board meeting, but um, that is one of my biggest concerns because that we know that those that's the most vulnerable group of staff um, because they actually have to be more high touch. So I said all that to say uh, with the preschool, um, it, 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 we really, if we could try to figure out a way to, to consider them in this uh, prioritizing of the after school is going to be important. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so just a couple comments. Um, so, you know, I do think that as we sort of referenced before that, you know, on, we're on the precipice of cold and flu season. And so we have, have to be prepared to pivot in response to that. Have, have, with that in mind, I know that as we sort of start to look at this group and we start to think about how do we bring other kids back to school, in the coming, you know, in the coming, as that, as that discussion really kind of heats up, you know, we also have to, I, I think it's important for this board uh, in partnership with, you know, uh, uh, our senior staff and administrators, as well as AEA, to really come up with the criteria that we can all agree upon um, that makes sense for how we would rationalize either bringing students back um, or or not bringing them back, and then if we bring them back, what would be the criteria for 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 going back to remote online? I think I think it's super important, um, you know, that because I think that I think the community at large is, is a little confused, um, you know, uh, and, and, and which makes a lot of sense, right? Because there are there it's doing it's doing experts out there in the community, right, and and state wise and federal wise. So there's a lot of reason why why, people, why folks are confused. It's really incumbent upon the folks who are on this call. Um, again, along with our partners over at AEA as well, to make sure that that we can kind of sit down together and kind of figure, all right, what are the criteria going to be, you know? So that way, you know, when we, when we make decisions, um, you know, we're not in a situation where, um, you know, the community and the papers at large are like, we, the rationale here is not clear. Um, I think we owe it to the community to make sure that, that we have a very sort of clear and kind of laid out rationale and criteria. now. I'm not suggesting that I know what that criteria is or should be. I mean, we, we, let me be very, very clear about that. But I know that there's a lot of smart folks in this community, you know, infectious disease specialists, et cetera, you know, that that, that we can begin now to, to have conversations with to kind of put together what that criteria would look like. And I do think that ultimately that's a document that should that we should have prepared for the public to be able to view. 
um, that, you know, that way. Now, I, I get it that, that whatever document we come up with is not going to satisfy everybody. And you could argue that doing a document like that just opens us up to take even more um, sharpshooting, if you will. Um, but I, I do think it's important for us to at least try, um, you know, and so, so you know, I, I guess to think about that, that, that criteria. And the other thing, too, that, that I, I didn't say this earlier and, and I want to say it now is, you know, I, I've seen articles and I, you know, talk to folks in the community and there seems to be um, this need to compare APS to other districts within Summit County. Uh, and, and let me just state for the record, those of you who are listening or who may play this back, um, that is not the right comparison to be making at all. Um, you know, because those other districts have, they might have one high school, they might have two middle schools, they might have five or six grade schools, you know, they have a much less diverse demographic, um, you know, so, so it, it's an apples to watermelons comparison. You just, you just can't do it. So I think if we're trying to, you know, uh, help to inform those in the community, I think, I think that has to be part of the narrative as well. If you want to compare us, if you want to evaluate, you know, a district that is the best urban in, in the state, you know, compare us to what Columbus or Cincinnati or Toledo or Dayton, that's the more accurate and appropriate comparison group uh, as far as what we are and what we aren't doing. So, again, you know, so, so I just I, I just I want folks to and, and it's important as we sort of develop this criteria, you know, for folks to keep that in mind as well. That, again, we're not comparing Akron to Talmadge or to Barberton you know, um, or, or Green or Stowe, you know, or Hudson. I mean, you know, th these are much less diverse districts, much, 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 much smaller as far as staff and students. And so, again, I, I saw, I saw like I'm, I'm on a soapbox about this, but I was, I've really been upset by this, but by the narrative that I've kind of seen popping up, uh, in, you know, in and out of various places in, in the community. It's not the right comparison to make. Um, and then, um, you know, I, again, I think that, you know, I think Miss Brady, I think the, the plans that, that you put together, um, I, I think it's a fantastic, you know, sort of uh, set of options for us. Uh, and, and I'm looking forward to I guess the question I had for you is, do we I, I know that we weren't planning to vote on this tonight. I'm pretty sure uh, I, I, as you mentioned, it's just a draft. But I guess my question is, is in the absence of a vote um, or are you looking for feedback from us tonight as to sort of what option we we prefer you to start doing more work around? I mean, without a vote, I guess, you know, I don't want to confuse the issue, but I, but I also don't want to, um, you know, I also don't want you, to, I, I guess I also don't want to uh, have you sort of uh, doing additional legwork on options that maybe aren't as seriously being considered. So, so again, I'll, I'll defer to you, Ms. Brady and Dr. Dr. James, kind of, kind of let us know sort of what you need from us tonight to be able to move forward in the most expeditious uh, and, uh, um, and efficient way. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hall. You know, um, part of our work is that, you know, everything doesn't require a board resolution. I think sometimes they're, you know, what we call administrative discretion or we hear what uh, direction you want. And um, if we're gonna do this within, for instance, if we're, if the consensus is we should go with option C, then staff will work on putting option C uh, in place, you can certainly, you know, vote on a resolution for that. But sometimes, you know, um, I go back to one of our former uh, board members, uh, Linda Kersker, God rest her soul, who would always sit on the end of the the seat at the end of the board table in the old uh, boardroom and say, you know, we need to give the administration a little wiggle room uh, because there's always some issue that comes up that's a little different. Um, you know, that might be a one off, but we have to handle. So, you know, my whole thing is, you know, you all know that we're certainly going to, you know, consult with, um, of course, Summit County Public Health, where, you know, we have, you know, some of the best special education staff and teachers, I think, in the state. These people really do care about the kids. We've already talked about some of the extra PPE that you know, we would want available for staff, you know, not just face masks, but shields and gowns and things like that. So, you know, I, I have my confidence in our staff that we could come up with that, you know, finalize that option. And um, with all the people on our team would be ready to go um, probably within a couple of weeks at a minimum um, and, and, and start that and, and always report back to the board and send you the documents and things that, you know, what have the information. We're already, um, preparing to, 
start a survey with our parents because that's important. Um, we need to know which parents are interested, what services we have to line up, even if, whether they're interested in meals, because there are, those are some things that if it was a daytime thing or evening, you know, how we're going to do that. So, um, you know, if you want to certainly vote to say, you know, we have the authority to move forward with that plan, um, you know, as we uh, need to with periodic updates to the board, I think we're prepared to do that. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. And and again, I'll defer. I I will defer to board and leadership on how they want to proceed on that. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Dr. Akbar. So, I don't know if we need to do a vote, but if we do, I'm definitely um, fine with it. I'm just want to make the statement that I'm in favor of us moving um, towards option C. Um, and having after school options and support for our special ed students um, and making sure that we have, uh, you know, the necessary uh, support for them uh, while we're still in the remote um, environment. I would echo that as well, Dr. Akbar. I'm in favor of providing some support for our special education students. I think the options that you put together were uh, well thought out. And um, as Dr. Akbar said earlier, I know there's a lot more behind that than the summary that we're seeing, uh, but I do think it's important that we start to address some of the concerns that we've heard from parents. Um, I also am in favor of option C, and I'm also in favor of giving the administration a little wiggle room to work around those instances that May, may be outside of uh, what we can think of in this uh, brief discussion period. Is there anyone else with questions? Uh, Mr. Alexander, go ahead. Yes, and, and I agree with, with you guys with the, looking at the option. I think we should give the administration uh, the, the option or the opportunity to look at this here and to start digging, make a, take a deeper dive in developing a plan uh, to be able to, pre to present to us and say, okay, hey, here's what we come up with and here's the reason why, the rationale, for this and then uh, give us the option to say, okay, go ahead and move forward and uh, implement it. Because I think that's a, a good, what I want to guess, a good section of, of, of areas to start on and then be able to move forward with those so we can be able to, to do it. Because if we, if we don't give them the option or opportunity to go ahead and start moving forward with this and start looking at this and saying, okay, we agree on C, all of us agree on C and let's start working towards it. Then they're going to get behind. It's going to be too much to, to, to to, to start. So we need to go ahead and allow them to start looking at that, developing those plans, and then letting us know where they're at, and then we give the okay. Well, there you go, Mr. President. I think I think we've got some coalescing around option C. <laughs> so, uh, but but I, I would like to hear from uh, Miss Miss Autry and Miss McKittrick. I you know again I don't again Miss Mansfield as well. But I, but I know that it sounds like there's at least four of us that are coalescing on option C. But would want to hear in any dissenting viewpoints from my colleagues. I do not have a dissenting viewpoint. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Roger that, ma'am. <laughs> Ms. Roger, did you have anything to add? I do not either. <laughs> Thank you. And I agree with, uh, with allowing uh, Tammy and Mr. James and Dr. McWilliams Woods to um, continue this work. And um, I, I think our goal all along in this is to A, keep kids safe, right? But B, get them engaged in as much of an educational process as we can. And with these students, um, it, it, it gives us just that extra challenge. So um, I think that we need to give them the leeway to do what they do. Good, thank you. And Mr. President, I do have one more comment <laughs> that um, under option C, we will be using our current um, procedures through Akron after school. So we already have, I mean, that isn't really the health aspects of it, but that's, um, you know, how we would hire the folks to do, um, you know, the interactions with the kids. So it's very, uh, um, is similar to what we would do in a normal school year. We have the infrastructure set up already to be able to process um, 
you know, how we're going to pay people, how we're going to hire people. So that really is a, that's like a piece of low hanging fruit um, in order to get that implemented. All right, great, thank you. Any other, anything else from your report, I guess? First? Oh yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, one, um, on our uh, working through, you know, our time will be running out through, I think, uh, November 11th or re really November 9th for our reopening plan. Um, I don't know if Dr. McWilliams Woods wants to add anything to that, but we have people really working through looking at all the aspects of how we could or not reopen, but a transition away from 100 percent virtual and um, how that could look. And we might have a few initial ideas on that. I might actually fix some things with you, uh, Dr. Gray. I might have policy representatives actually talk about because that was part of their report to talk about just the timeline that we discussed at instruction policy that this week. So I don't want to steal their thunder. Okay. Mrs. Mansfield. Okay. Um, I don't remember if Valerie was going to talk about that part or I was, but we did talk about that in our instructional policy meeting. Um, we talked about the timeline for that, and some of that was uh, transitioning from 100% remote at the next nine week period. We talked about having um, the superintendent present on October 12th, and then um, with a request for a decision no later than October 26th. And um, Valerie, do you wanna add more to that, Mrs. McKittrick? Sure thing. Um, the other part of that is that Dr. McWilliams Woods is gonna attend committee meetings in October to discuss the proposals that the teams have come up with. And that that's pretty much our, our report for instructional policies far as the reopening teams and their proposals go. We have one more item, but I'll, I will wait until we get to instructional policy. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McKittrick and Ms. Mansfield. Uh, Dr. Ellen McWilliams Woods, anything else? No, I think that's all for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Superintendent. Yeah. Um, uh, another issue that is coming up, which we don't really have guidelines, I'll be sending out tomorrow our internal plans based on all the information for winter sports, um, which would include, of course, um, swimming, bowling, wrestling, basketball, and also the club sport of indoor track. So um, I will be sending you um, the draft uh, procedures for that. There were some health guidelines that were issued um, by the health director, Ohio Department of Health interim director um, on September 25th um, about that, but we have not gotten any guidelines from the Ohio High School Athletic Association covering winter sports. Um, those dates for competitions are actually later this month in October and in November for actual competitions. Um, but on October 5th, we certainly, you know, would want to allow some of the practices um, to begin with the same uh, requirements that we were using for our fall sports. Um, you know, in terms of safety requirements, which I believe would be very similar, but not actually doing the competitions, which I think we can bring something if we get the Ohio High School Athletic Association guidelines quickly, I believe we can have something for your approval on the actual competition at the next board meeting. Dr. Akbar. Yes, yeah, so um, I have just one question that that just uh, made me think about, um, you know, one of the things about the fall sports is that, you know, they're outside uh, absent swimming and volleyball. Right. Um, 
but they're outside. And with 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 winter sports, they're all inside. And um, one of the things that when I was having a conversation with um, the Summit County uh, Public Health, uh, what, a month ago now? I can't remember when it was. One of the things that we talked about was the ventilation of our buildings. And one of the things that they mentioned they were not sure about, but thought maybe Akron was in better position because our buildings are newer. Maybe we have better ventilation systems, but I don't know if that's the case. So I wanted to just ask that. Um, that wasn't necessarily something that came up before, but now if we're right. thinking about winter sports. I just wanted to revisit that. Right. Yeah. Well, they right. With our building automation system, I think all of our high schools can get the requisite number of air exchanges per hour. What I will have to do is look at um, Kenmore Garfield because they're in an older building, but all of the new buildings have um, systems that we can adjust um, the airflow into the building. And I'll have Rob Boxler look at Kenmore Garfield and see what we can do there because that is an older building. I appreciate that. I think that is just um, as we do review the plans, that's something that we, we probably need to yes. look at. It. Yes. And we may have to do something similar as we've done with, um, you know, with uh, Ellett's football, you know, limiting the venues where there can be competition. Those are some things we might have to look at. But again, we're not, you know, we have about, you know, a little over a, about a month before actual competitions would begin. Um, and then again, I'm looking at what are the Ohio High School Athletic Association guidelines going to be um, for the winter sports. Yeah, Mr. Alexander pointed out North as well. Yes, thank you. Anyone else? Any comments, questions? Anything else, Mr. Superintendent? Yeah, a couple more things, sorry. Um, there are two major grants that we are um, putting uh, applications in for. Um, one is with the Hewlett Foundation and the other and one is with the Chan uh, Zuckerberg Foundation. I like Dr. McWilliams was to speak about those briefly. Yeah, we're very pleased uh, to share with the board two major grants. Uh, the first one, um, the superintendent has mentioned in board meetings, and I've talked about it in instructional policy because it's really been a year long journey with the Hewlett Foundation. Um, this past year, we did site visits, two site visits with them, and we've had numerous meetings on uh, a $1.5 million grant application all around supporting our college and career academy transformation, focusing primarily on middle school, but with some reach in elementary and high school as well. The three areas of focus for that grant, um, and, and they revised this focus based on the unique year that we're all living through. So the three focus areas that we're writing to is fostering student agency and engagement in their learning which obviously fits us beautifully um, with looking at student, expanding student voice, student leadership opportunities, some equity pieces around how we're all of our opportunities for extracurriculars and clubs to make sure that's equitable across all of our schools, um, developing some additional maker spaces in our middle schools um, and those types of strategies all under that student agency and engagement. Then the second area is enlisting parent and community support for student learning. And it's focused on sharing information and involving in key decision-making. Um, so uh, Carla Chapman is taking a leadership role on that around redesigning our family collaboration systems and looking at how we're organized around supporting families. And then um, 
hosting all of the family academies that we've talked about with you, especially with all the reopening, how important that is, some of the digital literacy skills. So now we'll have funds to be able to support that, as well as linking families to some of our key partners on workforce development um, strategies. We want our families to be first in line at all the opportunities for career uh, exposure and workforce development. So we wanna make sure we have the linkages for that. Um, so those are some of the examples. The third area is supporting educators as they adapt to these unprecedented circumstances and really boosting their craft and looking at ways to make that happen. Um, and we, some of the strategies under that will be looking at redesigning the way we do our professional learning system and integrating more with the universities to do kind of embedded um, uh, college courses and professional learning simultaneously through the school year and going deeper on looking at our equity for our higher uh, level courses that I've talked with all of you about um, in the board meetings and looking at some of the systemic ways that we need to build that in starting at middle school through high school and then expanding some of our fifth to eighth, fifth to eighth grade career exploration. So all of, all of the college and career academy pieces that are in our master plan um, that you'll be entertaining over the next couple months for our middle school will be able to have funding um, from the Hewlett Foundation. And then the second incredible opportunity, um, and I should say the Hewlett Foundation came to us from a relationship with the Martha Holden Jennings Foundation, who has been providing great support for our middle schools already. They funded all of our design um, for the master plan and our initial implementation phases. And so they brought us, uh, brought the Hewlett Foundation to us and when they heard about our college and career academy work, they, they thought that it was just a perfect fit for them. Uh, then we also received, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, the superintendent received uh, a contact from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. And uh, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative is working with the Ohio Department of Education on some policy initiatives for the whole child strategy that's in our new ODE strategic plan. And the state superintendent sent them to us because they were looking for exemplar districts to help fund kind of the next level of work uh, that was already happening in districts that were doing some innovative practices. And uh, so they sent them to us and said, with this work with ODE, we'd like to fund some additional initiatives that all are wraparound whole child approach, which includes equity, social emotional learning, um, any kind of racial justice type strategies and accelerating student voice. Um, and so we thought that sounded really good. We looked quickly over this past week with them. Um, they're also interested in funding trauma informed instruction so all those strategies are already embedded in our college and career academy work. And uh, so we will be submitting um, an application in a couple weeks to them focused on uh, our elementary college and career academy work and some expansion of our family resource center um, so that we can use that as the hub for that whole child approach and whole family approach. So we're excited about that. The Hewlett Foundation is $1.5 million. The um, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative can be from anywhere from $1 million to $1.5 million. And that one is due, you know, we just found out about it a few weeks ago and we're submitting it. So that's a quick turnaround, but we feel like it's a perfect fit for the work uh, that we're doing under our College and Career Academy umbrella. Any questions for Dr. McWilliams Woods? It's very impressive. All right. <clears throat> okay. Um, the last item I have is um, 
in the obituaries today in the beacon there was an obituary for a lady by the name of jane walker snyder who passed away on september 22nd of COVID 19. and many of you may not know who she was but um she ran the akron council she's the executive director of the akron council of world affairs and in a partnership with akron public school she ran a program called global scholars and with um, a couple of our high schools, uh, Ellet uh, participated and Bokdal participated um, over the last several years. She would bring diplomats from all over the country, from their from all over the world, actually, from their embassies to meet with our students and have discussions about world events, what's going on in their country, the economy, and how um, you know those students fit. Um, into the world. And so I, I think that's a great law. She was a wonderful person. And I think a lot of our kids got a lot out of um, that program. And so she will definitely be missed. And that's it for my report, Mr. President. Thank you so much. Uh, for President's report, I'm going to keep it relatively brief. Um, the first item is just the, uh, obviously, you uh, know that we finished our written evaluations for the superintendent and treasurer and uh, time permitting still this evening we are planning to go through uh, the, the conferences for both of those um, which is another reason why I'm keeping my report somewhat short tonight. Uh, on the superintendent search Dr. Akbar and I have met twice just to do some preliminary discussions around that. Uh, we also had a, a meeting today with representatives from OSBA uh, to discuss uh, what a search process utilizing OSBA would look like. I think we were both uh, very impressed um, with uh, the work that they put together and they had sent us a draft proposal and some information ahead of time, which we do plan on getting to all of you. Uh, he and I are meeting this week again on Friday for a follow-up working session uh, to talk about the superintendent search as well as our retreat follow-up uh, to continue that work. Um, our plan is uh, to bring you some options and a discussion at our next board meeting so that we can bring you uh, the options, uh, all of the options around uh, the replacement for our superintendent, um, whether we do a search and whether or not we go with OSBA and what that looks like, with the idea being that if we did choose to do a search, um, that we would approve a contract at least by our second meeting in October and we would begin the pre-planning work with uh, OSBA in early November. Uh, they recommended December and Dr. Akbar and I pushed back a little bit and said we need a little more extra, little extra time. We've got a lot going on as does everyone else and we don't want to get lost in the process and find ourselves scrambling a little bit. So. Uh, it, ideally, this would be a, a three or so month process that would begin in January uh, and culminate with us um, having a superintendent in place uh, and allow for some overlap uh, before Dr. James uh, departs. Uh, so again, we're still continuing those discussions. We'll bring you some more information. We'll probably be emailing you out a lot of that information ahead of next uh, the next board meeting with plans to have a discussion here at that board meeting. So keep an eye out for that. As I mentioned a minute ago, we're still continuing with the retreat follow-up. Uh, we had a discussion last week. We're doing a little bit more of a deeper dive and working session this week to try and uh, narrow down and focus on those goals based on the feedback that you provided during the retreat. Uh, that's the advanced APS uh, document that we had distributed during the retreat. So we're going to try and shore up the goals and the language based on your feedback from the retreat and get that back out to you so that we can also continue that discussion. And uh, just finally, Dr. Akbar and I met uh, last week with Mayor Oregon and a few members of his staff just to talk about Akron Public Schools and, and uh, share some thoughts around uh, a few of the initiatives that we have going on. Um, I would say the, the meeting went well. Uh, we both walked away with some things. And you know, one of the interesting things that we talked about that uh, Dr. Akbar had suggested was an area that the city could help us with and, and maybe even fodder for future discussion is around uh, diversity and recruitment for teaching. And so I thought that was very positive and, and something that we'd love to continue to explore. But um, it was a good meeting and uh, 
And so we'll, I'll just leave my report there, um, unless anyone has any questions. Yeah, Mr. Alexander. Yes, I do have one question. Will you guys be uh, reporting out to the rest of the board members uh, the discussion that you guys had with the mayor so we could uh, get an understanding of what's going on, what's happening, and uh, maybe the, the possible concerns, if there's any concerns or uh, more partnerships and so forth? Yeah, uh, given everything that's going on, I think with COVID-19, with the budget and the levy, with uh, the superintendent uh, retiring at the end of this uh, school year. Uh, Mayor Horgan really just wanted to touch base, um, share some, some thoughts and questions around that, wanted to know uh, if the board had decided how it would proceed with uh, selection of the next superintendent, uh, wanted to know uh, what the board's commitment was towards uh, college and career academies and our uh, community partnerships that we've developed over the last few years. And it really was just a, a, a very informal discussion around those types of uh, questions. Um, we had questions for, for him as well uh, uh, around the superintendent search, but as I said, also uh, Dr. Akbar, uh, when he asked if there were areas where we might be able to work together and, and the city might be able to help us, uh, Dr. Akbar mentioned uh, diversity recruitment and hiring. And uh, so we even talked about uh, the possibility of continuing those discussions. Um, so there, it was really levy, future of APS, superintendent search, and really just him getting a feel for where we were as a board. Okay. Yeah, I think that's good stuff for all the board members to know, you know, and sometimes maybe even if it's a one page or something, or maybe you uh, get something out to us just saying what's going on. So we all are aware of what's happening and what's going on in case we're, you know, someone tries to uh, ask us a question about something and we don't know it's kind of hard to, to to respond if we need to at that point in time so just yeah and certainly if you have any more uh questions uh feel free to reach out to me or dr akbar um and we'll follow up with you offline but i mean that was really it uh, what we had mentioned before when i sent out the email letting everyone know that we were meeting with them it was around the future of APS. that was really what it was more of a question and answer session for them to be able to find out where we were Okay. Thank you. Ms. Mansfield. Um, just thinking back to when we did the search for Mr. Pendleton, I know that um, at that time the board was presented with more than one party to help us to do a search. Um, you know, this is a superintendent, different situation, COVID. There are so many reasons why that may not be easy. Just wondering if um, you, Mr. President and Dr. Akbar, are um, exploring OSBA and other options or OSBA is the only one that you are planning on looking at right now? I did mention when Dr. Akbar and I met that we had used OASBO before as well. And so certainly they're an option. I think given what we are hearing about the timeline for getting something posted in January and we still have pre-planning work to do, um, we can certainly add another one to the mix if there's one that you would like us to get a proposal from and look at in particular. Um, I think my only concern would be with our meeting schedule too, just getting uh, enough of enough of those vetted and getting the options to the board and still having time to do the pre-planning work and get everything posted by January. I mean, we're already bringing you the options on October 5th and hoping that we'll pass it on, or I'm sorry, October 12th, and hoping that we'll pass it on the 26th so we can start in November. Uh, so we can certainly add another one if you think, or if the board thinks maybe we should be looking at OASBO as well or a private search firm. Uh, but we've only spoken with OSBA. I just know, I mean, honestly, by statute and by virtue of, um, you know, who we're replacing, this is the, um, this is the hardest, uh, hardest thing we'll ever do as a board. So, uh, you know, and most important, how about not hardest, but how about most important thing um, by statute that we do. So I um, want to make sure that we do this right. And again, I would say it also, Dr. James has set an incredibly high bar, so. Agreed, and please uh, let us know. And if, and if that's something that you 
uh, think we should be looking at is maybe OASBO or another firm. If you've got someone in mind, please let me know. We don't want to leave anything out, but we also kind of went with the obvious choice for at least getting a proposal to start with as a discussion point. Um, if you want us, or same with uh, Dr. James, if you uh, would recommend that we also, you know, add a second proposal in there from another group, please let us know. We'll do. Mr. Alexander. Yes, and I, I agree with Lisa. This is going to be our high, and we're going to. Uh, this is a very, very important uh, piece of, 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 of Akron Public Schools, and uh, I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not. I'm not saying that we have to look at other uh, um, or uh, individuals or groups that have uh, some type of uh, superintendent search, but I think we we need to make sure we're open. And I was going to ask the question: Are with OSBA? Are were they looking at just a local search, meaning Ohio, or are they looking at a national search? Uh, because that's two different things. If Ohio OSB, OSBA is just looking at a statewide, uh, that's one thing. But are they looking at a, a national search? And I, I personally think we need to look at a na national search because we may miss out and not say people in Ohio that could really do the job or maybe even people that we have in our district. But uh, I think it's just always good to, to get a, 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 a more broader view and perspective versus just a small snap snap snippet of what, what we were trying to to, to uh gather so I, I mean my thoughts i think it's the national search should be what we we actually look at yeah thank you the proposal from osva just uh fyi and we'll have a more formal proposal sent out to you but the proposal uh, is all inclusive and it is a national search okay thank you Any other questions for me? Can I, there, um, oh, yes, Dr. Akbar, sorry, go ahead. I just want to add one thing. While um, I definitely agree um, on some hands uh, with uh, Lisa saying that we, we should definitely um, look at other, you know, it's good practice to have more than one option. Um, I I will also say that I think with the timeline that we're we're looking at, um, we can definitely look at another option. But I think what might make the most sense um, and where we are is to get you um, the proposal and our thoughts from our meeting with them um and see if you are even interested in it i think if you find reason to not want to go with them or you know something that you're you think that we should be providing or should be provided and they're not providing it i think that then we can do that uh you know part of it is i will say um they you know i'm i'm a I'm a critical theorist just uh, in, in, in academic training and just in who I am. And I, I will say that they, many of the questions around uh, search equity and uh, diversity, they actually did a really good job. Um, and, you know, uh, Mr. Bravo uh, somewhat chuckled when I said, you know, I really wanted to have uh, questions for you on the way you screen your candidates, but I really can't. Um, and everyone knows I'm going to look at the way, if I look at nothing else, I'm going to look at the screening of candidates uh, because that's where you get most of your equity issues. So I just want to put it out there um, about that, that I think that from what we did receive from them and the meeting, that I think it it, it is um, high caliber. And I'm, I'm if that's what we want to, if you, want us to go um, and look at someone else, I think we probably should know that now. Um, otherwise, I think let's look at the proposal that we have, and if we find reason to go after somebody else, we can. I think those are the two options that we have. Yeah, this is um, 
Dr. Hall, sorry, just to Wayne for one second. Um, yeah, I, I would definitely agree with all that. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I've got questions as well, but I think I, I think you know you are all planning to, to sort of share with us the proposal. So I, I think I suspect my questions will be answered in that proposal. So I, I, I so I, I'm going to defer to to uh, to board leadership on this one and just wait for your proposal and then and then sort of share any questions I have after 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 we we receive that. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, hearing and seeing none then, that concludes my report. I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Pendleton for Treasurer's report. Thank you, can you hear me and can you see uh, what I'm presenting? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank, you. Yeah. thank you, thank you. All right. Um, now that the budget's in place for the end of September and we're moving forward, uh, I wanted to present this. It's a, just a snapshot of what we've been talking about in Finance Committee. As you can see, we're in a pretty complicated time in our history. We're, we're nearing the end of our levy cycle in traditional sense. We've uh, got the global pandemic effect on a cut in revenues, uh, addressing a deficit on our current five-year forecast. And then at the bottom of the screen, you see the complexities that um, there are four components of additional funding. And as uh, really a special thanks to Dr. James and Dr. Ellen McWilliams Woods for adding to our plate here. And we're very fortunate to, to have that problem, but you can see if we secure those two additional grants, there's an additional almost $3 million of two separate grants that will have um, specific guidance attached to it, how and when we spend it. And so this budgeting season is really complex. And so I just wanted to highlight this. We're gonna talk a little bit more about this in Finance Committee, but as you can see in the highlighted section above where it says updated November forecast, I would say that the consensus we received after last Monday's finance committee was to have a uh, open finance committee with any and all stakeholders and maybe multiple meetings as it relates to district finances, as it relates to COVID finances, as it relates to the reopening finances. And uh, as you can see, we need to secure as much input on this as possible. And this is great timing, whether or not we consider a levy in May. And that's gonna be my, my next point. And hopefully you see the timeline on the levy. I did wanna put into writing for a board about if we choose to go on a May, I want, us, I want you to see what resolutions are required and when, and kind of what next steps need to be done. So by January 11th, we need to pass a resolution of necessity. We've seen that before for our uh, previous attempt. And then uh, in January 19th and or the 25th, we wanna look at a resolution submitting the question. And those are the, the required resolutions to place it on the May ballot. I will keep these timelines in front of you, both your finance committee and reporting back to the board as a whole. And as you know, um, there is a community component to this levy. I wanted to put up the other topics there about marketing, partnerships, fundraising, even board liaisons to a levy, all need to be decided in a fairly short order if we're to proceed. As I leave those deadlines back up there, one more item to report on tonight, and that is, uh, I know we've been anxiously awaiting for the announcement of substitute House Bill 305. And officially that is going to be a press release on Tuesday, followed by uh, testimony on Tuesday and Wednesday. I'll be presenting base costs, likely the first testimony on House Bill 305 Tuesday, and um, then distribution on Wednesday afternoon with uh, so about eight other superintendents and treasurers from around the state of Ohio. So we're pretty excited about that. I know there's a lot of other topics to discuss tonight, but I'll leave that for finance committee. That concludes my report. Thank you. Good. Thank you so much. 
Any questions for Mr. Pendleton? All right, hearing none, we'll move on to committee reports with legal contracts and board policy. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Um, the legal contract and board policy uh, committee, we met on uh, September 9th. So uh, we will be meeting again on October the 5th. Uh, and we had a few uh, points of uh, discussion for that meeting on that agenda. Uh, and we had uh, Dr. James, uh, present as well as uh, board members, uh, Alan McKittrick, uh, Ryan, Ryan Pendleton, um, as well as, I'm sorry, uh, Patrick Bravo, our board treasurer, Ryan Pendleton. Uh, and then we also had our HR executive director, Kathy McVeigh, and our diversity community relations director, Carla Chapman, and Dr. Erica Glover, um, our recruitment and retention coordinator, um, as well as uh, Deborah Folk, our executive director for business affairs, all there um, at the meeting, and we uh, discussed. And we just, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, it, yeah. it went on my hands. So I could not tell. Uh, so we discussed uh, multiple items. One being the. Uh, we received a presentation on the employee resource groups and those employee resource groups um, were or it are uh, being re re researched uh, by uh, both uh, Carla Chapman and Dr. Eric Glover uh, and they presented uh, that to us um, based upon our, our um, resolution that declared racism as a public health crisis and uh, employee resource groups or ERGs were a part of that. And so I just wanted to highlight two things uh, as far as that. One, we the ERG should be self-governing um, and they should also have support of the administration so in the district office to allow for communication to leadership as well as to uh, provide support uh, for staff in all classifications to receive um, support in participating in the activities of the ERG. Uh, they have, the second point is um, they have formed an advisory group uh, with staff and administrators uh, from buildings to begin to talk about uh, the interest uh, in employee resource groups and what types of employee resource groups that we should have. Uh, one of them, uh, Dr. Glover mentioned, was the residential educators uh, licensure program as a potential uh, ERG. And we all know the REL is the program where they're um, working with uh, future teachers or people uh, interested in being teachers to get their license. Um, and so that's an alternative way to get uh, more diversity within our education um, field. And so they, they talked about that as a possibility. There's many other things um, that are possible that the advisory group is exploring, um, you know, veterans, LGBTQ plus, um, and even uh, the Akron uh, Alliance for Black School Educators, which, you know, are already things that exist uh, that could become ERGs. So that was one part of the discussion. The other part of the discussion, we we discussed um, the board policy development um, for the first readings that already came to you. And we also talked about uh, the racial equity policy. Since that meeting, um, as we stated in our last meeting, um, that we were going to come to uh, this body uh, with the first reading and submit you the um, the the policy um, after our last meeting and we have done that and so um, we we want to know that um, you know you have uh, an opportunity to provide us your feedback both uh, Mr. Alexander and I 
are willing and ready to uh, provide any support that you need. Uh, there are, uh, just to go over uh, the areas, there are, um, you know, eliminating systemic disparities, uh, ensuring systematic, uh, or I'm sorry, systemic equity in teaching and leadership, as well as parent engagement. We have hiring, training, um, recruitment, training, hiring, and retention, supplier diversity. Uh, we also have uh, financial leadership and resource allocation and information on implementing and monitoring uh, through the establishment of a board equity uh, committee, as well as the establishment of the chief diversity officer role at a similar level as uh, all the other executive directors, and then a decision, um, a district decision making tool uh, that will allow the district to begin to audit uh, the decisions in which uh, not only the district makes, but what we make as a board um, and then ensure that they are um, following um, equity and, and distributing allocations of resources uh, in an equitable way. So with that being said, that is um, all I have. I don't know, Mr. Alexander, do you have anything to add? Or actually, since we had uh, Mr. Bravo and Ms. Um, McKittrick at the meeting as well, any anything else? I think you did a very good job of explaining it, Dr. Akbar. And, and of course, I had to miss the meeting, unfortunately. But uh, you did. It. I just want to let everyone know that it, there was a lot of work that went into it. Dr. Akbar uh, did a lot of work. I did a lot of work. We had Diane Fidel look up some information for us. We looked at what was going on across the nation and what school districts, which was very few school districts who had uh, racial equity policies. And then we began to gather information and put it together. And we shared our information and we blended it together. And I think we have a good policy for board members to look at. And we, as Dr. Akbar mentioned, we love to get everyone's input uh, uh, on the policy and uh, any things you think that maybe we should add or you have questions about, feel free to contact us and, and we'll answer them. But I, I, I thought it was very good. And I want all of us to know we should be proud that we're one of the few, uh, we will be one of the few districts across the country that have a policy like this. When you ask most of the, the districts, uh, for if you ask a, a district for a racial equity policy, they send you their equity policy. That's a difference. One is uh, equity itself, and this is racial equity. So uh, we're, 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 we'll be one of the few districts across the country that have a racial equity policy. I, I, I'm sure there will be, once we pass our policy, there will be districts across the, the country that will be uh, coming to us and wanting to uh, see our policy and ask questions in reference to our policy so they can work on policies themselves. So uh, in saying that, I want to thank Dr. Akbar especially because he's, he did a good job in, in doing this and even pushing me a little bit to keep me on task, which was which was was good because I had a whole lot going on as well. And then I thank Ryan as well because Ryan is always inspirational in helping us with keeping things on track of what we need to do and making sure we get it in and get everything out so we can uh, move expeditiously. So thank you all for that. Yeah, thank you. And thank you both for your work on this. We were a leader in this area when uh, Mr. Alexander brought us the equity policy back, I think, in 2016 or 17. And now we're a leader again on, on getting a racial equity policy put together. And it's pretty comprehensive. Um, and so hopefully everyone will take up the uh, charge from the uh, Legal Contracts and Board Policy Committee and, and share your comments and thoughts and feedback on that. So thank you. Uh, finance and capital management. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I will go ahead and start us off here. Uh, finance committee met uh, a week ago today uh, with myself, uh, Dr. Hall, um, Mr. Bravo, Mr. James, Mr. Pendleton, and Dr. Akbar and Val McKittrick were also in attendance. Um, and Ryan already mentioned about House Bill 305 that we did review as well. And I just want to continue to thank him for uh, representing us uh, in, a, in a good way and, and being uh, present for testimony that will be uh, moving forward next week, as he mentioned. So thank you very much uh, with that. Um, also, uh, legislatively, we discussed Senate Bill 350. 
um, which is the bill that will essentially uh, require us to use yellow buses only. And um, a special thank you uh, to William and Dexler, our transportation coordinator, uh, who I believe testified on our behalf against that bill uh, last Wednesday as well. Um, and just so you know, essentially, it would cost us an, an extensive amount of money uh, to be able to accommodate that. Um, just needing an additional 31 buses um, in addition to the uh, additional wages and benefits, uh, property that we would need to acquire to store the buses in addition to mechanics, et cetera, fuel. So we are definitely uh, in opposition uh, to that particular bill. Um, and one of the other things that I mentioned as well is uh, what our relationship with the Metro bus system here in Akron, many of our families and students rely on those bus passes uh, to get to back and forth to work after school and also on the weekends because they're also able to use the passes for that as well. So um, that would be something that, you know, yellow bus service wouldn't be able to uh, support us in. So um, again, a thank you to, to Mr. Ann Dexler uh, for uh, testifying on our behalf uh, against the this particular Senate Bill 350. Ms. Autry, can I interrupt there real quick? Yes. Anytime that uh, we have an uh, administrator, board member, or somebody advocate on our behalf, uh, Dr. James and I like to, um, again, so everybody knows for the books, on our own expense, we like to give them a, a coin for advocacy. And I'll show that on the screen so everybody can see. And even though this is virtual, we'd love to present this in person, but uh, we're going to give a special thanks to Mr. Ann Dexler and uh, Deb Falk for their testimony. And uh, we were able to make some conversations out in hallways also in the State House. Uh, so we'll be giving that coin to them in the near future. Thanks for letting me interrupt that. Thank you. No problem. So um, with that, I will actually turn it over uh, to Dr. Hall um, to report further on what we discussed last week. Roger that. Thank you, uh, Ms. Autry. Um, yeah, Mr. Pelley, when you when you when you pull the coin out in the military, it's a tradition for us in the military as well to give coins. Um, it, it, I can't tell you how many coin coin law issues I've dealt with uh, in my in my army military career already. Uh, <laughs> um, it is so complicated. So I appreciate you qualifying it by saying, "On oh, dime." Um, you know, we didn't use extra district funds to purchase the coins. I appreciate you saying that. So just brought back some flashbacks. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> so coin law is its own thing. Uh, having said that, um, uh, yeah. So so again, Mr. Pelley sort of covered for 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 the public as well as for the board already um, an update around the appropriations. Uh, so, I, so I'll move quickly through through the rest of this as well. So we, we did talk about um, the, the implications of COVID-19. So there was an update around that, um, where we sort of, again, kind of cataloged or inventoried uh, the various COVID-19 relief funds um, that, that, again, you've also kind of seen um, sort of walk through tonight as well. Um, you know, we talked about uh, the expense reductions, you know, due to online learning, uh, and we also talked uh, a lot about the impact of not pursuing a levy in November 2020. So, so things that, again, we've kind of recapped tonight for, for the public as well as for the rest of the board. Uh, we also reviewed an article uh, in the ABJ, uh, Akron, uh, I'm sorry, Akron Beacon Journal, uh, regarding the Akron Tax Abatement Program and, sort of, and, and some of the possible effects that that program could have on. Uh, you guys recall, you know, um, we, we rely a lot on property tax. So, again, if, if you know, we're, if we're creating... Um, a tax abatement program or continuing an abatement program, I guess is more accurate to say, um, you know, that is going to have some impact on, on our collections. So we should have talked about that as well. Um, next, we, uh, you know, again, you know, tonight we talked through that levy timeline. That was one of the things that we talked about and the importance of having that ready for tonight. So, so, so we're going to thank Mr. Pennon for, uh, you know, uh, he and his team for having that ready to go tonight for, again, the public and the rest of the board to, um, you know, to review. Uh, and then last but not least, we talked, again, you know, as a regular standing agenda item moving forward, uh, we, we, we do and we'll continue to have uh, an equity and finance conversation. Um, and so, uh, you know, so, so we talked and took a deeper uh, look into um, 
staff experience at various high schools and sort of and, and, and began sort of talking about sort of the equity implications of that as well as, well as how we can begin to use, use a forecast five tool um, to do some further drill downs um, you know uh, on topics related to uh, equity and finance uh, across our district and so I know as, as we move forward um, those of you that that join that you know that will be a, a regular um, agenda topic for us um, you know, so we'll spend a time at every meeting moving forward, um, sort of, uh, you know, continuing down that road and journey, because I know that we've all talked, you know, I, I know we, we've done a lot of talking about this as a community. And, uh, and so this, this group, you know, we are committed to, to translating uh, words into actions. And so, um, so again, so we'll, so thank you for those of you that have been attending and, and thank you for those of you who will hopefully will, who will continue and also uh, begin to attend as we move forward. So um, with that, I will pass it off to, I think it's instructional policy um, committee for their report. Yeah. Any questions or comments for finance? All right, hearing and seeing none, instructional policy and student achievement. Most of our items have already been discussed with the um, reopening teams and their proposals to the superintendent. Uh, the only other article to mention is um, the update on the graduation seals that are part of graduation requirements now. The district is providing visuals for students and their families that explain all the seals and when those roll out. And that information to the students and families will go through our, go out through our counselors over the next few weeks. And that's instructional policy, thank you. I'll just click add to please make sure you click on all of the great handouts that were in that portion of the board meeting. There's also a great video story. Um, and also just a reminder about the College and Career Academy um, virtual, uh, virtual Academy um, 101s that are coming up. Um, but that's not, is that worse? We're, we're not calling them that anymore. Virtual information sessions. <laughs> yeah, we are. We're still calling them Virtual mm -hmm. Academy 101. Um, so uh, go and see, uh, take a look at those um, as board members. And so you can see what this, what folks are learning, but also encourage them and um, share the, that information. It'll also go out to parents in lots of ways, but um, a great way to learn about what we're doing in high schools. Great, thank you. I was actually gonna comment on the handouts there. I always appreciate those. Any comments uh, or questions for instructional policy student achievement? All right, hearing and seeing none, we have no unfinished business, but Mr. Superintendent, you do have a resolution under item 30.1 under new business. You're muted. <laughs> yes, sir. A resolution in remembrance of uh, Reverend Dr. Diana L. Swoop from Arlington Church of God. I did deliver that on Saturday morning uh, during uh, the calling hours. Thank you for doing that. We appreciate that. And certainly our thoughts and prayers are with the family. So thank you. At this time, we do need a, a motion, or we're looking for a motion. So move. Second. Thank you. I have a motion for Mr. Alexander and a second for Ms. Autry. Any comments, thoughts, or uh, feedback on this resolution? Mr. President, just just quick comment. Um, you know, I had a chance to attend her church on any number of occasions and i just I, I was i was stunned just i was beyond stunned asked and so um you know it's it's it's, it's yet another shining light um that has been extinguished too soon and so um so I, again so i i want to thank dr james for, for his work around that because again that she was a truly remarkable human being um and just was i just was absolutely stunned stunned and, and heartbroken to see that she had passed and so again uh, heart, uh, heartfelt thanks to uh, dr james and uh, for his work around um and, and this group as well for putting this together thank you well said and certainly her, uh, the work from her and her church that they've done with our kids was certainly remarkable as well so yes thank you appreciate that we do have a motion and a second roll call please Mr. Alexander? Yes. Ms. Autry? Yes. Mr. Bravo? Yes. Dr. Hall? Aye. Mrs. Mansfield? Yes. 
Mrs. McKittrick? Yes. Dr. Akbar? Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And we do have a need for executive session this evening pursuant to Ohio Vice Code Section 121.22G1 to discuss the employment of personnel of the school district. So we are looking for a motion to recess into executive session. So Thank you. We have a motion from uh, Ms. McKittrick and a second from Mr. Alexander. Okay. Any, all right, roll call, guys. Ms. Autry? Yes. Mr. Bravo? Yes. Dr. Hall? Aye. Mrs. Mansfield? Yes. Dr. Akbar? Yes. Mr. Alexander? Yes. Thank you. And for the benefit of the public, we are gonna recess into executive session. Uh, there are no items uh, on the agenda, at least at this time, for us to vote on after we return from an executive session, but you're welcome to join us for shortly. Everyone can please exit this meeting. We'll see you in executive session. Thank you. And welcome back. We are returning uh, from executive session to our regular meeting for the Akron Public Schools Board of Education for Monday, September 28th, 2020. There is no other business to come before this board, so we will take a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. <laughs> we have a motion and many seconds. Or we'll take a second. Who's, who's going to second? Val takes first. <laughs> Okay, Val and, and Mr. Alexander, we'll do that. All right, so we have a motion and a second. Um, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Good Everybody have a good night. Good, good night, night, everyone. Have a good evening. Dear, good, good luck tonight, buddy. <laughs> Try to yeah. get some rest. <laughs> I'm crying. <laughs> Thanks, Bruce. <laughs> we'll see you.